Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm finishing off with the Finding Truth guy, who actually seems to have a fairly decent grasp of some of the basics of evolution, but then takes a sharp left turn into Crazy Town when it comes to some of the other basics of evolution. Let's see just how far into Crazy Town he goes. So my question to you, how many two-celled organism, organisms did you hear about? Well, including the bicellular diplococcus bacteria, one that I'm aware of. Please name 10 of them. Why 10? That seems like a rather arbitrary number. If I could name 9, would that make evolution unscientific, but as soon as it hits 10, suddenly evolution is true? What's special about 10 here? Would not the existence of a single one demonstrate that it is possible for them to exist? Or is that not sufficient for you for some reason? There are millions of organisms on this planet. The latest estimate of 2011 was 8.7 million. Let's say there are 10 million. Okay, that's nice. How is this relevant in any way? There is essentially millions of multicellular organisms, animals and plants, for example, and millions of single-celled organisms. Where are the millions of two-cell, three-cell, four-cell, five-cell, six-cell, 10-cell, 100-cell, 200-cell organisms? Where are they? I don't know. Does it matter? There are animals with fairly small cell counts. Some rotifers have less than 100 cells. And there are multicellular bacteria and algae that have even smaller total numbers of cells. We've already discussed bacteria that live in groups of two, though they are more cooperative bacteria than truly multicellular, and algae that live in groups of four. Not to mention the fact that the algae that has been observed in the process of developing multicellularity as a stably heritable trait tend to prefer having eight cells. So it went straight from one to eight. Why would we expect there to be a bunch of bicellular organisms still kicking around when one of the times we watched multicellularity develop, it skipped straight from unicellular to octocellular? And that's ignoring the fact that more than 99% of species to have ever existed have gone extinct. And it seems to me the smaller organisms with poor cellular differentiation would be prime candidates for extinction once differentiation started to really ramp up. After all, that's the main advantage to being a multicellular organism. You can have groups of cells that specialize to do one job really well, instead of each individual cell having to do everything for itself. So the smaller multicellular organisms are no longer quite as a adapted to being small as the single-celled organism, and they don't have enough cells to specialize quite as well as the macro-organisms, and so extinction is the probable course for them. The fact that we still have a couple kicking around is actually rather remarkable in itself. And you cannot give the answer off, they perished. Why not? That's happened to a lot of species. I see no reason why an organism with 16 cells would have a particular competitive advantage over a larger or smaller organism. It makes sense that they would have died off once cellular differentiation started working its magic. Shit, I said magic. That must be me admitting that it's impossible without an appeal to the supernatural. Well, guess I'm retiring from atheist YouTubing. Again, what is that now, twice in one week? Why? Because since they formed, since natural selection gave them the leeway to form, it may, means they had an advantage. They are better than their predecessors, and their predecessor is a single-celled organism. Yeah, I can see how you got there, but you're missing one of the key ingredients here. Single-celled life had at least a billion year head start on multicellular life. So whatever advantage was conferred on the multicellular organisms that allowed for that trait to develop and pushed it past the cell count in the dozens up to the thousands, millions, and trillions, the size advantage no longer belonged to the organism with 16 cells. So now we have an organism that is using extra resources to produce 16 cells instead of one, and the advantage of size doesn't really apply anymore because bigger organisms have now evolved. Perhaps the selection pressure is even reversed and caused them to shed their cellular buddies and become unicellular again. My point is, we're talking about evolutionary predictions here. Nowhere in the theory of evolution does it predict that an organism with a specific number of cells should have survived for billions of years without going extinct. And if single-celled organisms still persist and exist till today, then their successors 
would rather be here today because if they're not here today, the single cell survived and the two cell organism did not survive, it means it shouldn't have persisted and survived or existed. So I think what that rambling bit was trying to say was that the selection pressures that led the organism to develop multicellularity as a trait obviously favored multicellularity for some reason or another. So if having more than one cell is better than only having one, and the ones with two cells didn't survive, then the ones with one cell should have died as well, since two cells is better than one, and same for four cells being better than two. Four cells good, two cells bad. Which, yeah, I can see how you could think that, but I feel like I've already adequately explained how single-celled organisms could persist while small multicellular organisms did not. Anyway, it should have been ruled out by natural selection, and life should have stayed at single-celled organisms. Or, perhaps, the selection pressures didn't really apply. Think of it this way. A motorcycle is a single-celled organism, a car is a small multicellular organism, and a van is a large multicellular organism. A single person living by themselves might find themselves wanting a motorcycle. They only need to get themselves from point A to point B, no one and nothing else. So in their life, the selection pressure is favoring the motorcycle. But when they move in with a partner, and now they are two people who might want to go places together, they may keep the motorcycle around for individual trips, but when push comes to shove, the selection pressures are favoring the small multicellular car over the single-celled bike. But then they have kids. And kids come with stuff, and things, and friends, and junk. So now that large multicellular minivan is looking mighty tempting. So there go the selection pressures. But then a midlife crisis hits while puttering around in the minivan, and getting a nice crotch rocket seems like an appealing way to escape the drudgery of parenthood. So now we have selection pressures for the unicellular motorcycle again, but at the same time the selection pressure is favoring the large multicellular van, with no pressure selecting for the car. So the family may exist in a state of owning a motorcycle and a minivan, but no car. And then you come along and say, you claim to have owned a car once? Well, I see a motorcycle and a minivan. If you have both of them, you must still have a car. Otherwise, you never had a car to begin with. This analogy is imperfect, but it speaks to the main point here. Selection pressures change. They are not constant. Sometimes they will leave basal organisms and modern organisms around while having cut out the middle. Sometimes they won't. It depends, and it changes all the time. The question is, why do you accept a theory that tells you that a 30 to 40 trillion cell organism like the human being or any other animal or plant that have trillions of cells exist from the first cell through evolution? And you're not asking this question. Well, I mean, like I said, it's a combination of the selection pressures not favoring the multicellular organisms with smaller cell counts, and the fact that such organisms actually do still exist. Where is the answer that the theory is offering? I've given what I consider to be an adequate answer. What's your answer, though? That it was magic? How is that helpful? Even if you conclusively demonstrate that this one question somehow proves all of evolution wrong, all you have done is proven evolution wrong. You have not come up with anything to replace it. Creationism, whether it be Christian, Islamic, or some other flavor, amounts to just stating that God did it and leaving it at that. This is not useful at all. Even if God did it, why can we not examine the natural world to try and figure out how God did it? An examination of the natural world suggests that if a god did indeed do it, he did it through evolution. Well, I mean, that's what we're talking about here, so that's where I'm going with it, but insert whatever science covers the origin of whatever topic you want here, and it still works. God did it through geology, God did it through the Big Bang, God did it through stellar fusion, etc. Please do your research. I have, and I feel like I've done more than you. Feel free to watch through my Evidence for Evolution playlist if you like, that's where I've done my most in-depth research. Please look around into scientific papers. Several of which are linked in my description, which I used as the source material for answering your question. None of them were hard to find, though some are behind paywalls. Check with your local library or university to see if they can get them for you if you don't want to pay for them. Hell, oftentimes if you're showing a genuine interest, the scientists who wrote the papers would be more than happy to email you a copy, so reaching out to the authors of the paper is sometimes a great way to get around paywalls as well. Scientists generally get excited when people show interest in their work. 
like I have gone here and there. Like you have done here and there? Well, here in this video, you have not provided a single source, and there are none in your description. Your description is just essentially a summary of what you've said in the video. No links, no citations, no scientific research to back it up. And if you have done the research elsewhere, why not go through the trivial exercise of including your sources in the description of your video if you actually want people to check up on the accuracy of your statements? Why should I have to hunt through your channel to try and find the sources you claim to have used when you don't even give a hint as to which things you said even have sources backing them up? And you will find that there is no answer. I don't know. I feel like I gave a few answers. And your question was itself based on a misunderstanding, so even if there were no answers to your question, that doesn't say anything about evolution because your question betrays your lack of understanding about how evolution works in the first place. The reason is, there is no such evolution. Well, no, even if everything you said in this video turns out to be correct, that doesn't leave us without evolution. That just leaves us wondering why there aren't more small cell count multicellular organisms. And the fact that small cell count multicellular organisms do actually still exist just kind of flies in the face of your premise anyway. But even if they didn't, that would just leave us with another question to answer. What happened to them? Because evolution as a whole does not hinge on the existence of a creature with a particular number of cells in its body. If you have evidence that three or four or five or ten or one hundred cell organisms existed... I feel like this dude buffers for a bit and then plays on two times speed to catch up once he's done buffering. Please show me. Sources are in my description. My Evidence for Evolution playlist is also a good place to go. Not for this specific topic, but for other lines of evidence that point us to evolution. Please show yourself before believing in a theory that not only does not provide evidence, but provides predictions. There is lots of evidence for evolution, and it makes many predictions. Endogenous retroviruses are one of my favorites. Viral DNA that is inserted into the germline of our ancestors pretty much randomly, and into genetic code that is 8 billion letters long, chimps have the same viral DNA in the same locations as us. How could that happen if not for common ancestry? We've also got homology, both morphological and genetic, comparative embryology, vestigial structures, fossils, phylogenetics, biogeography, and direct observation, among others. But there are no true two-celled organisms, therefore all this other evidence is wrong. Is that what you're getting at? They are in total contradiction with the reality and when with what they claim to be the fossil record. Yeah, the fossil record. It shows sequences of evolution, and it shows the general progression from less diverse to more diverse, which is predicted by evolution. The only exceptions to increasing diversity are the mass extinction events. So, yeah, an asteroid hits that kills off the majority of the organisms on the planet, and that'll set diversity back a bit. But aside from mass extinction events, diversity is always on in the upward trend, as predicted by evolution. That confirms the validity of the theory of evolution by natural selection. I realize that English is not your first language, but you need to work on your cadence. These weird pauses keep throwing me for a loop. Though, to be fair, that may not be the product of English not being the first language. I had the same problem with Greg Kokel. I leave you with the thought to continue the journey to find truth and to verify whether we are the product of randomness and blindness where we are creations created here by purpose and intent. Well, selection pressures are not random, but they are acting on random changes, so there is a random element to it, but it's just not completely blind random chance like creationists like to pretend. But yeah, there's enough weird evolutionary leftover stuff going on in our bodies to make me think that we are not specifically designed for a purpose, but are the products of blind natural processes. Did you know that you have a hole in the roof of your mouth covered by skin that leads to the vestigial remains of a Jacobson's organ? That's the organ that snakes are using when they smell the air with their tongues. They stick their tongues in the Jacobson's organ for olfactory analysis. You know that weird face that cats make after they smell your feet? That's them using their Jacobson's organ to analyze your foot smell for other cat pheromones. Or, in more layman's terms, your stinky feet smell like cat piss. 
But why would we have a non-functional Jacobson's organ if we were specifically designed for a purpose? That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Facundo Seiza, who says, Psychologists have shown that hallucinations didn't work like that, which is referring to a line in a video on the resurrection that is trying to counter the idea that 500 witnesses saw Jesus alive after he died. I believe doctors have shown that human bodies don't work like that, resurrecting after several days and walking around with a gaping hole people can finger. Selective skepticism is annoying. Yeah, well, you forgot one key factor. They have magic on their side. So there. Also, I'd be more likely to believe if Jesus were to let me finger his gaping holes. So that point doesn't quite stand. Only a handful of people in history were privileged enough to have been present for that demonstration. The rest of us just have to take their word for it that it totally happened for realsies. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Sage Croft for your letter. Sage is a young aspiring filmmaker who already has a few credits under his belt, like Dear America, a film by Generation Z, which I'll link to. Also, yes, it is Z. Special thanks as always to my patrons, David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the bicellular organisms that demonstrate the transition to the multicellularity that is my channel. If you'd like to mysteriously vanish from the face of the earth, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!